And uh, at that time, it was called Kalamazoo Village. And Singapore was actually the big town. So if people wanted to come into Sawtuck, it was very, very difficult for them to get here because there was no play, there were no bridges. So if this was not open at the time. They would have to literally cross the uh, water a couple of times to get down here. And um, so um, a few of the, the uh, rivers in Michigan were, uh, were affordable or easy to cross, and they were very difficult to bridge. Uh, one of the problems with the Kalamazoo River is that it's quite deep, so it's, it wasn't really easy to bridge it. There must have been some very, very, uh, some early attempts to, uh, to you know, do bridges here or put ferry service in, but uh, we really don't have any uh, records that, that tell us what they did. Possibly there were some walk-along ferries, and what a walk-along ferry is, it's a, it's a long rope with knots tied in it. And they would pull that across or throw it across, and then you would literally pull from those knots uh, to get the, uh, the little barge across or something. But it was uh, the problem with that was when you dropped the, um, the rope into the water, it wouldn't sink. It was in the way, so uh, the boats would crash into it and stuff. So it was uh, really kind of a difficult thing. I got all these hands I got to use here. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk for a minute about what the configuration currently of the um, Sawtuck uh, uh, chain ferry is. On the east bank, you've got you know what we call the uh, the ferry uh, landing, and that at one time had a little shack there where you bought your ticket. The chain ferries obviously. Can you see on the other side? So okay, we can look at it over there. Yeah, okay. yes, I'm going over there. Yeah. I'm going over there. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. This is like an example of the earliest picture I could find of the chain ferry so that you had some idea what it looked like with a big uh, horse-drawn wagon on it. And then on the west bank, you've got um, you know, a sort of a less, uh, less formal uh, landing there. And uh, in 1911, May Heath, who I, I, if you don't know who she was, she's sort of considered like the mother of Sagatuck. Uh, she wrote a history on Sagatuck and was very, very well known. She opened a little store called the Heath Shop. And uh, she sold little trinkets. She rented boats over there. And it was the West Landing for the uh, chain ferry. Now, originally, it's believed that, um, that there was um, well, we know that there was a bridge across the Kalamazoo, and it would have looked something like this probably. Because, because it was too deep in the middle of the Kal Kalamazoo, and it would be at Mary Street. There, from an engineering standpoint, there was no way to put pilings in, and there was no way to do a drawbridge. So the belief is that there was a floating bridge. Now, uh, it would have been a floating bridge. This is actually a picture of the one that went across uh, Gosshorn Lake here. But the floating bridge, it's believed, would have had a hinge mechanism so that you could release it and then it would move with the flow of the river and kind of open up and then with a rope they could pull it closed again. Now, it was terribly, terribly flimsy and um, the schooners were constantly crashing into it. And they had, they had other problems all along with the chain ferry, too, with kids would go and cut the boats loose. And, uh, but um, nonetheless, uh, this was not a very good solution. And um, it, it was abandoned in 1857. It probably wasn't there very long. And from the records in the newspapers, it didn't seem like anybody missed it when it was gone. <laughs> so, All right, so in 1857, the ferry was proposed, and Darius Billy, Billings won the contract to run it. Now, he was only 19 years old, so he legally uh, wasn't able to sign contracts. So his dad, John Billings, bid $300 and won the contract to uh, start this ferry. And of course, they decided to go with a chain ferry for the very reason is that a chain is heavy enough 
that when it's not being, in, when it's not in use, it'll sink, sink down to the bottom, and therefore be out of the way of any boats that are coming in. Now, a chain ferry is propelled through the water uh, by turning a crank through, through which a chain passes. The chain drops to the bottom when not in use. The guys got horrible blisters from this cranking, by the way. Uh, it was very, very difficult to turn that crank at that time, and it took a lot of strength. And it actually was James Sheridan, who was Jack's uh, dad, who uh, in the uh, early t uh, part of the 20th century figured out that you could put little pieces of pipe onto that, and then it would turn without giving you those blisters. So he's the one that's all, and at least he takes credit for it. I mean, most of the information I got is from his book. So there might have been a little bit of bias there. Uh, and I think, let's show you over here. This is what we're talking about right here, where there's this little platform that sticks out, and then that's where the crank was, and they would just turn it in, it would go through cogs and that, and it would pull the, um, the boat all the way across. Can any idea the date of this picture? Yeah, it's kind of hard to date them, but um, I think it's a little bit later because the ferry shack is over on this side. Okay, it's really interesting as I've been studying this, that ferry shack tended to switch sides. <laughs> and I think it was just movable, but there was, I think, a little more formal one here before, and then they moved it to that side. So I'm going to guess probably around 19, 15 to 20. Okay, this would be the time of Jay Myers. Yeah, we'll get to him in a minute. Okay. All right. So the, the new chain ferry proved to be a great success. Um, you know, there, there was always boat traffic around, and, and that was a little bit of a problem, but at least the chain didn't get in the way. The problem was that there was little attention paid to safety in the early days, and there was never insurance in the early days. Uh, mostly because it wasn't required. There was no law that said you had to have it, so they didn't have it. The scows that, that were used for the ferry were flat wooden boxes that leaked and had to be hair pumped out. So they, they were, you know, they were very, very heavy. They didn't draw a lot of water, but they did leak. And the way they would, uh, uh, what they used for a bilge pump was a little piece of downspout and a little crank. And it would kind of suck the water out. And, and for those guys that worked on the uh, chain ferry, that was one of their jobs every morning, was to make sure that it was pumped out and they had to patch any little leaks that they saw. So, I mean, one, one of the things they had to do every day was to um, make sure that the boat wasn't going to sink. <laughs> and then also there was a problem, and I'll talk about this a little more in a minute, uh, they had to make sure that where, where the ramp was to get onto the ferry, that you got down there and you dug everything out again because it would silt up. So that was one of the jobs that they had to do every day was to make sure that the ferry could get all the way to the little ramp. Um, there was only one accident on the chain ferry, and that was in 1910. And it was Joseph Randall who died trying to cut, well, what happened was, he was going across, he was the, uh, the ferryman, and uh, they were taking across a, uh, a, a load of uh, uh, trunks to go to one of the resorts. And uh, one of the trunks fell off the top of the cart and startled the horses, and they just started running. And of course, they were in the middle of the river. So they, the horses ran into the river and pulled the cart down with it with him, and he drowned trying to cut the horses loose. Okay, that's the only uh, death that we know ever on it, or at least that they admit to it. <laughs> so, and one other time, the, uh, the chain broke and the ferry drifted uh, um, downriver, and but the, uh, it was Charlie Greenhall with his, uh, he had a power boat, and he went and attached it and towed it back to where it was, and they replaced the uh, chain, and it went on. In the meantime, just to give you some perspective of what was going on, Ed Densmore um, decided that they needed a bridge between Saugatuck and uh, Douglas. And um, it was, you know, it, it's really hard to understand how far away that bridge was from downtown at that point. 
And we'll talk more about that uh, in a minute. But uh, anyway, it was real swampy between the two cities. And uh, what he decided he could do was to lay a, a bunch of slabs in between in this marsh and then keep pouring uh, sawdust on top. And they put all these shavings and sawdust and they kept piling it up till it sort of made like a, a soft bridge. And then at either end, they built a little wooden bridge. The one on the, uh, the uh, Douglas side, that actually was the channel there. So that one was a drawbridge. But the one on the Saugatuck side was just a little wooden bridge to get across. And it worked for a while. Um, and, and that really helped uh, Douglas to begin to uh, become developed because before that there were very few people living in Douglas. By 1901, the bridges needed replacing. Oh, I wanted to tell you one other thing on this. It was Thomas Gray, who and everybody made fun of him at the time, who went and got all these little willow twigs and went all along that causeway and shoved them into that sawdust. And that was why in pictures you would see those willow trees on either side. But it was actually Thomas Gray that put that in there. And then, of course, we know that later on, um, you know, the new bridge was built. But when the bridges wore out, or when that causeway wore out, on the, uh, uh, let's see, it would be on the north side. Yeah, the north side, they, they bought an old bridge. Jack talked about this last week. They brought an old bridge from New York. Uh, a metal truss bridge, and they installed that where the wooden bridge was on the Saugatuck side. On the Douglas side, uh, they had to do something, so they put a swing bridge in. And um, let's see, the, um, the, the chain ferry was absolutely invaluable during the construction. Uh, the only other way to get across at that time was either on, you, you could cross on the chain ferry, or you had to go all the way to New Richmond to go across the bridge that was down there um, in, in the Kalamazoo at that point. And of course, we know that this bridge uh, survived until 1936. Okay. Before 1900, a uh, sailboat ferry carried passengers using a direct route across the Kalamazoo Lake from the foot of Butler Street in Saugatuck to uh, Main Street in Douglas. The service was not an economic success. And what they would do is it would go all the way across, and there are stories where the kids used to kind of fool around because they had sort of like a flag system to let you know on the other side that you needed the ferry to come, and the kids used to go and wait for the flag, and then the guy would come across, and they said you could see him just you know, yelling at the kids on the, on the back there. But there was this need for people to get back and forth from downtown Saugatuck and to Douglas. And again, in a minute, we're going to talk about why that was such a big deal. And then in a boat much like this, from 1900 to 1925, ferry service was provided by George Tisdale from the foot of Butler Street in Saugatuck to Campbell Road in Douglas. So there were some power boats during the same time that were ferrying people. Now, back at the chain ferry, at least I gave you all that background, by 1900, the chain ferry became a tourist attraction. Okay, and again, if you notice in the picture, there was a lot of boat traffic. Everybody wanted to be photographed on there. But here's why it became such a big deal. You know, people who were living in the cities, it was a brand new thing that on the weekend you were going to go out and have a picnic somewhere. People were coming to Saugatuck because Mount Bald Head Park was one of Michigan's number one tourist attractions. People would come here, they would climb Mount Bald Head up to the uh, observation tower, and then they would come down and have a picnic. And it was one of the few really nice little parks where you could eat comfortably and kind of do something. And it was the uh, chain ferry that would get you across from the inner urban to the park. Because the inner urban did come into Saugatuck. All right, this is going to make Jane Underwood really happy. Okay, Jane Myers. 
1907, Jane Myers took over the contract for the operation of the chain ferry. He had been a millwright and he had supervised the dismantling of the Johnson Mill in Singapore. He had been in Saugatuck since uh, like about 1860 or even earlier. He had come from New York. Uh, he, had, he had a small farm in Lake Town Township where the Belvedere now stands. That was his farm. And he sold it before 1900. Of all the chain ferry operators, it was Jane Myers who was the most beloved of all. And uh, I think part of the reason, and, and they really liked him, and we'll, we'll, talk, and we'll, we'll talk about why, but um, I think one of the reasons that they raised money to put a bench up for him and that was he died, like it, it, he retired and then died within a year. And I think that it, it was a really emotional thing for people because he was so well liked. And you always saw him with his handlebar mustache and that pipe. And he wore this funny hat, which later on you'll see appears in a lot of artwork. <laughs> Here is a uh, photo of uh, Jay Myers on the left and Doc Heath. Remember earlier I showed you May Heath. This is her husband. And you may be familiar with the Heath building in Saugatuck. They were, they were kind of movers and shakers in that time. And the uh, ferry shack became the place in Saugatuck to hang out. Everybody <laughs> went there. I mean, when they went there, they sat there. Uh, you know, they, they, you could get eggs there, you could get milk there. Uh, it was just kind of a fun place to be. Um, okay. Now, this is, this is interesting because Jay Myers was also involved in selling milk. I, I just mentioned that he sold it at the, uh, the East, East Ferry um, uh, Landing. And I'm not sure if this is his, his stand or if he's picking milk up to take over there. But it is indicated that it's Jay Meyer here. So it's just one of those cool photos, you know, we need to do a little bit more, a um, uh, little bit more uh, study on that to find out about it. And you can see it's pretty early. I mean, these are all just wagons. Um, Notice, not a lot of paving here, how muddy it is. <laughs> now, this is the East Ferry Landing in about 1910, and I want to point out here, just do it right, right over here are the milk cans, okay? And so you could go in the morning and you could load up your milk pail, and he would bring eggs in and other little farm things, and they would sell them at the ferry landing. And of course, remember, May Heath was selling stuff at the other side, too. So I mean, talk about tourist hucksters. <laughs> How many <gonna> going? <laughs> yeah. And you know, another interesting thing is if you can, you know, there's so much in these photos, but you've got a couple of, uh, here's the guys working it, and then there's another one of those funny wagons on there, kind of loaded up pretty high. All right, and this is the West Ferry Landing circa 1910, so this would be probably right before that little um, store went up. Uh, I'll make sure I don't have any notes on that. Oh, in 1913, it was five cents for a round trip. Okay, for a horse and buggy, it was 15 cents each way. Uh, after World War I, during World War I, there was kind of terrible inflation. And so uh, after World War I, it went up to five cents each way, so it doubled in price. And for a car, by that time there were cars, it was 25 cents each way. So, uh, but it still was worth it. Now, on the West Bank, as we said, uh, Doc and May Heath built that small store, and she rented boats and sold candy and supplies. So little by little, the two sides of the chain ferry are kind of developing into, you know, little economic hubs. I mean, uh, obviously on the East Bank you were involved with Saugatuck, but on the other side you were starting to get some business and you had the hotels there. So uh, there was a reason, you know, to need to cross there. Here's a nice photo of cranking the chain ferry in, um, in uh, 1911. Notice on the other side, you've got, you know, the buildings, the beginnings of hotels there. And, um, now, here's the winter solution for crossing the Kalamazoo, okay? 
Children on their way to school crossed for free. That was part of the contract when you, when you were uh, given the, the uh, right to take people across. Ferry operation was year-round. When the ice needed to be cut, it was done with a saw. So, I mean, uh, Jay Meyer, this is Jay Meyer, by the way, in the uh, little scow there. He had to cut it with a saw. And uh, if it was frozen enough, then he would lay planks all the way across so the people could walk without slipping. Okay? If it was slushy, then they would kind of just keep getting the thing going through as long as, uh, long as it was safe. And if you got into one of those in-between things, it was the only time that he could just stay home. But they said that uh, Jay Myers was really conscientious. He was always watching the weather to see that, to make sure that people could cross. And um, there were ore-propelled boats uh, that augmented the scows for foot passengers. And that's what one of these is. Okay, And, and they were 15 feet long with a 5-foot beam. On wet days, they would use straw mats to sit on so that their, their behinds didn't get all wet. <laughs> and then after Jay Myers, uh, Leonard Britton took over. He was the, uh, ex, the uh, stepson-in-law of Jay Myers and the son of R.C. Britton, uh, who was the uh, ship captain who had the Britton house where the bank that was, or where, they, uh, yeah, where the bank is right now uh, in Saugatuck, next to the Rose Garden. And he was known as Cappy. Here is um, the ferry at the East Bank, uh, circa 1910. The last scow was built in the early 1920s. It was 40 feet long and 15 feet wide. Again, it was a large wooden box which drew very little water, but it could carry four cars. And Henry Perkins of Saugatuck, he was a Saugatuck boat builder, he constructed the last one. That's probably the one you're seeing in a lot of these photos. And here we see the ferry uh, leaving uh, the West Bank um, around 1920. And remember I told you earlier that one of the things they had to do was kind of dig out over here so that the uh, ferry could get close. Then later on, uh, Charlie Greenaw, and I mentioned him earlier, he had a, one of those little uh, power boats. And he would back up there, and he would rev the motor up, and then it would clean out all that um, all that sand, and then they didn't have to shovel anymore. So uh, they started it kept getting more and more um, modern. And you can see here, there's a car going across. I love the clothes on the people. The chain ferries were very, very important to the community. Here they are going across, by the way, you know, for a picnic, we're coming back. So there are two? Yeah, there were two. I've never seen that. Yeah. yeah, there were two. There was more than one. Oh. That's how popular it was. And why? Why? Why did they need two? <coughs> well, Park Street remained unpaved, greatly limiting its viability as a route for transportation. You either took the chain ferry across or you didn't get anywhere because it was just mud and fields. It was, you know, like it was very, very difficult to get into Douglas on the road. By the time Gene Palmer acquired the old Heath shop on the West Bank, the ferry store, as it, as it was now called, had become somewhat of an institution. Its proximity to the painting school at Oxbow made it a favorite with artists who often paid for supplies with a painting or a drawing. <laughs> the Great Depression greatly affected the chain ferry. By 1940, the Big Scow was abandoned forever. However, the ferry continued to operate for foot traffic, using small road scows to transport people across the Kalamazoo. There's a, this picture kind of shows up a little more close up where you can see the boat. But that is all like a rowboat almost. And you can see the remains of, you know, the cherry, the uh, ferry landing here. Yeah. Our 
R.J. Peterson saw possibilities in reestablishing ferry service across the Kalamazoo River. The new chain ferry was dedicated on August 21st, 1965. Now, I want to just take a few minutes. I'm not going to talk too much. I want to set this up for uh, Mr. Hess here. But I want to show you some images of uh, what makes the um, chain ferry so emotionally uh, exciting. And this, by the way, is autumn. You can see it. you're at the ferry landing, and there's the old the, the ferry store uh, on the other side. Here is a colorized photo of the ferry store at the West Landing in about 1940. There's a photograph. There are only that I know of. There are only four images of the interior of the ferry store, and uh, one of them is the painting on the right, which is in our collection. That was done by Francis Chapin, who was called the Dean of Chicago Artists. And this is one of my favorite photos of the um, chain of ferry, partly because it's color, but you can see the, the wonderful 1930s car on there. And uh, sort of three little boys there, how leisurely it is, and kind of a place you really want to be. And I think what's cool, too, is you can see how simple that landing mm -hmm. is. This is a Wilfred Berg drawing called Boats on the Kalamazoo. You can see the scows going across. Mm -hmm. This would be right in front of the ferry store. There's Jay Myers. There's that photo again. But uh, you went to night shipping, uh, studied at Oxbow under Fursman, and this would have been one of the pieces she did in class. And by the way, Jay Myers uh, was one of the models for Fursman's classes. I mean, that guy did everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I love this painting. This is a Fursman called The Old Boatman, and that's Jay Myers crossing. And the John Peterson called the Chain Ferry, and uh, he's sort of um, oh, taking off on postcards, and uh, you saw those photos with people having their picture taken on the Chain Ferry. It would have been done around 1997 or something, but he was sort of uh, copying that, that whole feel. And an Edna Hotchkiss called the Chain Ferry, done probably around in the 30s or around 1940. Uh, kind of one of the freest ones I've seen. Um, kind of really a romantic image here. And Ingve Soderberg, and Ingve was um, uh, Nurmdeem's uncle. And uh, he did this sometime while, while he was here. Uh, again, you can see, you know, the funny hats on them, the fairy shack. Kind of, um, it's kind of neat to see it with, with you know, just the, um, the simple lines here. And this is a David Livingston Adam. This is actually owned by the Women's Club uh, of the Fairy Shack. This is what the Fairy Shack, remember it keeps switching sides. <laughs> so it's when it's on the left side. I think that was in the 20s. Here's another David Livingston Adam with the same subject. Of, uh, I've never seen the painting, but we were sent a photo by somebody who, uh, I guess after reading Kit Lane's book, Painting the Town, uh, sent this photo and he said he, he never understood what it was. They just thought it was a shack on a lake. <laughs> and after the, seeing the uh, other one in the book, he, under, he realized that it was another version of it. And this is Rolla Taylor. Rolla Taylor came here from uh, Texas to study with Kurzman. <laughs> This is a painting that a group of members purchased last year for us. And uh, I want to thank them again. Some of them are in the room. Uh, but every once in a while, you know, we don't really have an acquisition budget, and something comes along that really belongs here. And that was one of them. And Carol Mouth, this is one of the oldest paintings we have. Actually, it was done in 1902. That's the ferry landing, kind of showing you what it would have looked like right at the turn of the century, kind of the way they would see romantic. 
And this is kind of cool. Here's a ticket from 1912 that somebody kept. It's not redeemable in 13. The JDM is J. Myers, by the way. Okay? Here's what's really cool about this ticket. On the back, oh, I can read it better here. Somebody wrote July 1st and 2nd, Tuesday night. Sometime. J.W. and R.H. So somebody really, I guess, kept this as a memento of a nice evening. All right, you're, we're done with me now. And so we're going to go to Professor Bill. And um, there you go. Thank you, Kevin. some of the challenges the city of Saugatuck is facing with it. We're going to have some fun, and then we're going to talk about what the future looks like for the chain ferry. First, we'll have a little quiz. How many manually operated ch passenger chain fer ferries similar to the Saugatuck chain ferry operate in the United States? No. Uh, very good. <laughs> it's the only hand crank chain ferry in the U.S. There's a similar one in Stratford on Avon in England, and Shakespeare did not write on it because it's only 80 years old. Our ferry is 160 years old. Secondly, what's the name of the current Saugatuck chain ferry? The Kalamazoo Crawler? The, the William Butler, Saugatuck Susie, or the Diane? The Diane. Yeah, very good. You know that one too. Diane was named for R.J. Peterson's wife. How does the mechanism work? A chain's attached to each side of the landing and lies on the bottom of the river. Can't explain that. The chain's wrapped around the cleat and padlock it, padlock so it can't come loose. There are two small roller sprockets on each end of the ferry, on both ends, and one large sprocket in the middle where the crank is. The chain goes through a series of gears and sprockets and this pulls the ferry from one side of the river to the other. Now, how does the chain mechanism work? It ch Did we do that one over yeah. there? Yeah. Oh, I hit the wrong thing here. <laughs> the amateur? <laughs> Thank you. Um, how is the chain ferry powered? The ferry is hand powered by the crew member. The crew member cranks the ferry, which to tighten the chain, which draws the ferry from shore to shore. It takes approximately 200 cranks to go from one shore to the other, and it takes about two minutes on a calm day. So what's the distance the chain ferry traverses between the two riverbank landings? 300 feet, a quarter mile, 250 yards, or 5,000 feet? 300 feet, about the size of a football field. It's at that narrow part of the river, and that's why it was put where it's put. Um, what are the responsibilities of the chain ferry crew? The crew consists of the captain and a crew member. There's always two members of the crew on board. They have load and load and unload the passengers. They collect fees. They sound an air horn to warn boaters. They crank the ferry safely across the river. When one crew member is cranking the ferry, the other standing his lookout. Uh, when the ferry approaches a landing, a crew member ties the ferry to the landing, and the crew members serve as ambassadors to the area, advising passengers of things to see and do, and giving them maps and information. So they're really an uh, important part of our tourist community. Oh. <laughs> I've been I'm going to be demoted again. Can you keep it? Yeah, I will do that. In summary, yeah. 
Thank you, Jane. <laughs> the chain ferry is padlocked to each side of the riverbank. It's not free floating. The chain ferry has no engine and it's manually operated. The chain ferry traverses the river in two minutes. It only operates on calm days from Memorial Day to Labor Day and has no recent history of safety concerns or accidents except for the one Ken told us about. And the crew consists of two CPR and first aid trained members. So what's the problem? What organization has jurisdiction over requirements for the crew of the chain ferry? The Saugatuck Douglas Harbor Authority, the City of Saugatuck, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, or the U.S. Coast Guard? Indeed, it's the Coast Guard. And that's where the problem lies. Which of the following is required by the Coast Guard of the captain of the chain ferry? Have 30 days of service on board the ferry and be 18 years, of, years or older? Take a nine-page physical exam, be covered under the U.S. Coast Guard Random Drug Test Program, pass a 25-question multi-choice test administered by the U.S. Coast Guard, or obtain a TSA-approved uh, transportation worker identification card. Oh. And uh, this is the list that the Coast Guard captain requirements are. And actually, we have the current captain of the chain ferry with us today, Tanner Nutty. And Tanner is going to talk a little bit about what this entails to become a crew member. Now remember, Tanner works three months a year, and that's it. But basically, go for it, Tanner. Do you guys need the microphone? No. Oh, no. Okay. Alright, so right now I have with me the, this is about 20 pages of paperwork that it involves that we have to fill out, go through, and send uh, out of the state to get Coast Guard approved. What we have to do is we have to apply to get these. Like, you don't, we don't, we don't just have them to do. So we have to apply for the Coast Guard to send us these. Once we wait about a month or two, we get them. Takes about this is about 20 pages of paperwork that you have to fill out, like to the T. If you forget anything, it all gets sent back. So this goes to Toledo, I believe, first, and then after they agree on it there, it gets sent to West Virginia for them to double check it. Now in the meantime, if you don't have the Twit card, this whole process doesn't go through. So it's all pretty much overbearing. After working on the chain ferries for so long, this is my fifth year of being a captain, I believe we can all agree that there does need to be some sort of regulations that we can follow. There does need to be some sort of responsibility. Uh, I believe that what we can do is get together with the Coast Guard and come up with the city and the Coast Guard on a test that we can do at the city level that they agree on. Mm -hmm. So that way there's still some sort of responsibility being formed but right now, all this paperwork, it's about a 9 to 12 month process to get it. And it co it's just overbearing. Like it, it costs a lot of money to, to take this test. It, it's 9 months of paperwork to take a 25 question test. And then in the end, all you get is... <laughs> <laughs> so, is that for just one year then? This, this is uh, good for five years. Every five years you have to renew it and it costs money to renew it every five years. It's about $700 for the whole process. The Twig card that Tanner was mentioning uh, went into effect as of 9 11, and it's for allow access to secure ports and harbors and vessels. It's from the TSA. Now, let's talk about the chain ferry and its secure <laughs> harbor and vessels responsibility. So, clearly, this is overbearing, and we can't really blame the Coast Guard because the chain ferry is so unique, they don't know where to put it, and that's our problem. So they put it in where they think it fits because there's nothing else like it. So, um, Before you leave from that page, can you go back? It, it says a nine-page physical examination. What does that mean, a nine-page? Go to a doctor and have a physical that you can okay. lift and, they, and do all these things. Okay, and the physical happens to be nine pages? Yes, okay. right. 
Um, here's some questions asked about the Coast Guard requirements, which we already got. Does the captain of Saugatuck chain ferry in operation for 160 years pose any security threats to the nation's maritime facility or vessels? Don't think so. Does a chain ferry captain need to meet more requirements than an interurban bus driver or the driver of a Saugatuck yeah. school bus? Yeah. Yeah. Does a chain ferry captain need to be enrolled in a year-round random drug testing program for a job that only lasts three months? And I think the answer is no. So, what's the future of the chain ferry? I think Ken got this picture and I think it's terrific. Yeah. The current, our problem is this, the current chain ferry manager is retiring. Marilyn Starring has been the manager for the city of Saugatuck for 10 or 15 years. There was an article in the Hall of Sentinel about it, she doesn't even remember how long. <laughs> Marilyn's a captain herself and knows how to go through all this process to get the captain to work with the Coast Guard. I mean, it's very, very intricate. I have the whole list of things that they have to do. It completes the whole page. The Coast Guard requirements have made it very difficult to recruit and maintain crew members for a part-time summer job. Tanner leaves, or any of the, I think there's, how many, are there two of you? Right now, there's two. However, last summer, I was the only qualified person with the Coast Guard captain's license, so, if I wasn't on the boat, the boat was not running. It could not. If I was sick one day, if I had a family emergency, the boat couldn't cross the river. So you work seven days a week? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Oh my God. The Coast Guard has not allowed an exemption to requirement for the crew of the Saugatuck chain ferry. We've asked and nothing's happened. So what's the city of Saugatuck doing? Well, it may look like the city council's taking a nice little pleasure <laughs> cruise on the Star of Saugatuck, but you might notice somebody in the blue shirt. Um, before last week, I would have been saying to you, well, the city is going to pass a resolution asking our senators and our congressmen uh, for help. We would have been asked you to write letters. Um, but last Thursday, Fred Upton came and took a ride on the chain ferry as a congressman in blue shirt and uh, Tanner's back there hiding behind the big guy. <laughs> but he rode the chain ferry, he cranked it himself, he said, this is really too much and I am going to do something about it. So that is terrific news. <laughs> So I have to say, Tanner charmed him. It was it just amazing. And the congressman said to me, well, what all the things does the uh, captain have to have? And I, and I said, Tanner, do you know? And he just peeled off all this stuff. You said something about someone came from California to ride on the chain ferry because they knew it was the only one in the United States. So. Terrific job, I wanted to tell you that here in front of this big group. You. And thank you. Thank you. Now, Tanner, do you want to hang around? If any of you have any questions, uh, we'd be glad to answer them. There's one that uh, the congressman asked. Is a chain pulled up every season? Yes. It's inspected and made sure it's safe and uh, it goes back down under the river in uh, Memorial Day and then pulled up after Labor Day. And we do replace it every so often. So it's not the same chain since 1850. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, take care of one more thing here. It's sort of become traditional anytime that I speak before this group. And, and in going back to when I taught, it's sort of modeling the behavior you would like to see in other people. So anytime I speak, the, the, the uh, society or the uh, history center always gets a gift. And uh, so what I'm giving this time, you saw this in the presentation, it's the colorized photo of the chain ferry from the 1930s. And this is uh, from Bill Malone and I, and it will go into our collection. Yay. Two quick things and we're done. One is if uh, Ken's the art curator for the History Center, 
And if you've never been in the gallery upstairs, take a chance at the elevators. You can go up the stairs. It's an amazing, amazing thing that he's done uh, with that. Question. Uh, does Marilyn own the chain ferry? No, the city of Sabitak owns the chain ferry. Okay, but she's the appointment. She's the manager. She, manager. We, we have, she's a contractor managing it. She sets a schedule. She helps get the captain uh, their licenses and make sure it all works. There's times if there's no captain, Marilyn's out there cranking up. Uh, Marilyn's retiring. So that's the dilemma the city's under. We won't have someone like Marilyn to let us go through this process. The second thing I wanted to say is if you've enjoyed these programs, the Tuesday Talks, and any of the monthly programs, um, I'm the chair of the programming committee for the History Center. And if you are interested in joining us, if you have some ideas, whether you want to just give it to us on a piece of paper with a follow-up of who you think could speak and things like that, or in uh, November of every year, we have a meeting where we plan the next year's activities. And we programs, the Tuesday talks and the monthly meetings. And we've already got some great ideas for next year. And uh, so if you'd like to join us, let Nathan or myself know. And if you come to the committee, it's just kind of a roundabout throwing out ideas. And it's, it's kind of a fun group. We meet once. Right? <laughs> but you may come away with an assignment if you say, I think this person should talk. And I'll say, well, fine. <laughs> That's it.